Um, good morning, buongiorno. Thank you for uh, coming. Thank you for again for inviting me to speak. And um, I say that this, I thought, Opensavo, I thought that this would be the first paper I gave. So the first slide, the first picture, it should be for the first presentation. Okay, but it's for me, it's a great honour uh, to be here. Uh, especially in a place uh, so closely associated with my friend Marco, uh, but also with my, my friend Ricardo. Uh, it's a big honour to be here. I haven't been here for a long time, so it's a great honour to be here where, in this place where he was so, so familiar. So thank you very much again. Today I'll, I'll talk about uh, archaeology and text, about the relationship between archaeology and history, uh, but also the way that archaeologists have used written sources and the way that, a little bit, about the way historians have used uh, archaeological material. Uh, this is a, a subject that I've been fascinated with for a, a long time. I, I first um, published on this subject in 1990. One, two, in Archaeologia Medievale, where I, I wrote a paper on medieval archaeology in, in the 1990s. This was a very primitive paper, uh, I see now. Uh, but in 2001, I then wrote a, a little book, a very little book, uh, on archaeology and text. This is here. Um, this book was what I, was what I thought then in 2001. Uh, I, was, I was then invited by the uh, American journal, the Annual Review of Anthropology, to, um, to update, to rethink the, the book Archaeology and Text. And so I published a paper in the Annual Review of Anthropology in 2006 uh, called uh, Archaeology and Text, Subservience or Enlightenment. And the reason for the the sub, uh, what is it, let's see, the the, um, the subtitle is that I, I think that what I said in the book Archaeology and Text was too strong, was too uh, doctrinaire, and so I, I changed my opinion a little, and so I published this here, and then I, I was invited by uh, Professor uh, Juan Antonio Castillo to write a paper for a, a book uh, to be published in Spanish. Um, this year or next year on historical archaeology and so I wrote another paper for for him and what you hear today is the paper that I sent to him a short version of the paper I sent to him so this is the most recent my, my, my most recent thinking on archaeology and text but this is the history of how I, I came to talk about this subject what I want to discuss is the, the relationship between archaeology and history, the archaeology and texts in what you might call the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, in Britain, in America. Uh, perhaps in Italy the relationship is different. Perhaps things are better, things are worse, I don't know. Perhaps we can talk later if, if it is different here. But what I talk about here is what happens in England and what happens in, in America. Uh, about the relationship between archaeology and history. Okay, this is a this is the old history, uh, but the relationship between archaeology and history is is archaeology the handmaiden of history? It means uh, the servant of history. Uh, does archaeology serve historical agendas? In uh, 1880, at the end of the, the 19th century, uh, Thomas Huxley, here, on a, on a tour, a lecture tour, designed to highlight the importance of Darwin's uh, discovery of uh, evolution, Huxley talked about the, the way that particular disciplines understand their subject. 
And Huxley said that the disciplines of history, of archaeology, geology, physical astronomy, and also paleontology, these subjects are all connected. They're all connected because they have to study that which they can't see. So we have to study the past, which we can't see. Astronomers have to study the stars, which they really can't see. Uh, geologists have to study the deep past, which they can't see. So we have to study that which we can't see. And he says that all of these subjects are linked with the, with, uh, by the, the fact that they have to forecast retrospectively, he, is what he called it. They have to forecast retrospectively. And he says they're also connected by the fact that all of these disciplines need to reconstruct a reality which cannot be experienced directly. So sociologists can directly experience their subject. Anthropologists can directly experience their subject. We can't, nor can historians, nor can geologists, nor can astronomers, nor can paleontologists. And so what he did was to, to make an equivalence between these subjects. So archaeology and history here are equivalent because they both have the same problems. He said, no, sorry. So this, this was Huxley talking about uh, the relationship between these disciplines. In, in this book, uh, Carlo Ginzburg, on a similar theme, he, he said in this book that all, all historical knowledge is indirect. And this is what Huxley was saying as well. All historical knowledge is indirect. We have no direct experience of, of what we study. The same is true of geologists. The same is also true of historians. They have no direct experience of what they study. So Ginsberg says all historical knowledge is indirect, it's presumptive, we presume, and it's conjectural. Okay, so, so again, Ginsberg is making an equivalence between archaeology, history, paleontology, all these disciplines which seek to study that which they can't experience directly. So there's an equivalence between the subjects. For Ginsberg, this, this fact that all historical knowledge is indirect this also applies to historians as well as to archaeologists. So Huxley said this, Ginsburg says pretty much the same kind of thing. However, in modern universities, in the modern academy, it seems that some historical knowledge is deemed more direct. It seems that some historical knowledge is less presumptive. It seems that some historical knowledge is, is less conjectural because where both texts and objects are found together, in other words, where there is an archaeology of historical periods where both texts and objects are found together, it seems that the written word, it seems that texts are presumed to be more direct. They give us a more direct access to the past. It seems that they give us a more immediate access to the past. This is the assumption. So where you have both archaeology and text, it's assumed that the textual written sources give you a more direct and immediate access to the past. Here we have the beginnings of a subservience of, of archaeology to history. Here we have the beginnings of a subservience of the object to the text. And this, this subservience of archaeology to history uh, began very early. Even uh, the very celebrated Danish antiquarian, Ole Wurm, who established one of the first museums in Europe, even he said that he would rely much more on the written word of Tacitus than he would the, the material objects from the prehistoric past. So even these great antiquarians believed fundamentally that the written word gave you a more direct access to the past than the material object. Assumptions about archaeology's inferiority to history permeate all historical archaeologies. And I, 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 historical archaeology for me is an archaeology, an, the archaeology of a period in which there are texts. 
So this means medieval archaeology, it means Roman archaeology, it means classical archaeology, it means Mayan archaeology, it means Sumerian archaeology, Assyriology. For me, it's historical archaeology. And so we have uh, Jean Botero, who's an Assyriologist, a very famous Assyriologist. And he tells us, for example, talking about the relationship between archaeology and history, he tells us in uh, one of his books on Mesopotamia, he says, in the absence of texts, in other words, where you don't have text, he says, we depend on archaeological research and we have nothing but material remains that are speechless. So the material remains cannot speak. And this is most famously said by, by uh, Philip Grierson in 1959 in a, in a paper on the Dark Ages where Philip Grierson said that uh, it is true that the spade cannot lie. Okay, the spade is archaeology. It is true that the spade cannot lie, he said, but it has that virtue only due to the fact that it cannot speak. Okay, so Grierson said this in 1959, and this, this idea that archaeology is mute, archaeology cannot speak, as uh, Botero here says, is speechless, is a, is, a, is a theme that runs through those people who work on historical periods. They assume that archaeology cannot tell you anything, really, in the absence of text about the, the, the past. This applies also to American historical archaeology. American historical, historical archaeology is a very strange phenomenon because American historical archaeologists believe that historical archaeology began in 1492. Uh, which, of course, is when Columbus discovered America. So for them, historical archaeology began when America began. So, it, but, but anyway, Ken, Ken Flannery, I couldn't find a picture of Ken Flannery, but Ken Flannery, even the great Ken Flannery says, it is one thing to present evidence for those phenomenon when you have living informants or when you have really good written documents. It is quite another thing to claim that you've recovered evidence for identities, for mentality, for belief. It's quite another thing to claim this when you've recovered evidence for them while digging an early woodland midden, he says. You can only proclaim ideas about belief, he says, a couple of times before your colleagues start asking what mesh size of screen you need to recover memory. So in other words, he's saying that archaeological techniques cannot recover these kind of things. And Binford, Lewis Binford, said pretty much exactly the same thing when Binford said you cannot excavate a kinship system. He said you cannot, ex there are some things that archaeology cannot tell you. Only texts, Flannery is saying, can tell us about memory. Only texts can tell us about belief. Only texts can tell us about ideology and politics. Archaeology can't tell you anything about these kind of things. And Binford said pretty much the same. And this is a common theme in people discussing the relationship uh, between archaeology and history. So here we have a relationship between archaeology and history in which you have a master-servant relationship. History is the master, archaeology is the servant. Archaeology can only recover certain kinds of things. Archaeology is the handmaiden of history, as was said many, many years ago. Uh, here, Archaeologists provide interesting finds to illustrate historical texts. They provide pretty objects to illustrate what historians write. Now, I should say this is changing very, very dramatically. And it's changing dramatically, especially among historians, because in England especially, historians are now using material culture in very, very interesting ways. Uh, but the, the old history was this. another version of the relationship between archaeology and history. Is the text biased and are objects uh, unintended and therefore do they provide us with a deeper insight into what human beings really thought? This is an argument. Okay, this is a, a man called John Wildman. John, John Wildman was a, a radical, an English radical uh, of the middle of the 17th century. And 
he was a radical. He wanted to abolish parliament. He wanted to abolish the church. He was, he was what's called in England a leveller. He wanted to kind of revolutionise society. And in, in 1647, in the middle of the 17th century, John Wildman said he, he dismissed written accounts. He dismissed the value of all written sources. And he said, those that were our lords, those that made us their vassals, would suffer nothing else to be chronicled. And this means what he's saying is that is that everything that is written is written down by and for lords. So everything that's written, all written sources are biased. They don't tell us about reality. They tell us about what the lords wanted to be chronicled. So the texts are biased. This is uh, uh, an early awareness, a very early awareness that the, the winners, the elites, the lords, these are the people who write history in, in, in this particular view of the relationship between archaeology and history. The winners write history. The texts that the winners write are biased. They're not disinterested sources. They're biased sources. They're very particular representations of the world. They're not objective. They don't tell us about past reality uh, as it really was. Now, from the 1980s onwards, in England uh, and in America, Historical archaeologists, uh, including Richard Hodges and, and Philip Bratz, a lot of other medieval archaeologists, these historical archaeologists, they, were, they, were, um, they took uh, confidence from the claims of new archaeology. And new archaeology claimed that it could reconstruct all of past society from the archaeological remains. Binford said, at, at one point, he said that it's not the archaeological evidence that's a fault. It's not because of the archaeological evidence that we cannot access ideology or belief or religion. He said it's our methodological naivety is what he calls it. We have not developed the methods, he said, to extricate these ideas from material culture. So it's there in material culture. We just haven't been clever enough to extract it. And so archaeologists, historical archaeologists, taking this idea from New archaeology said, well, if this is true, if you can re recover all aspects of past societies from the material remains, then we don't need the texts. We don't need the written sources. If we can extract everything from archaeology, we don't need the written sources at all. Now, there was also a, a kind of a, a disciplinary element to this in, in British and American universities where Archaeology was a very new subject. It was a very new subject taught uh, at degree level in British universities. And, and archaeologists like Richard, like uh, Philip Ratt, uh, archaeologists in America, they were struggling to make their subject a recognized discipline. And so in, in claiming that they didn't need history, they established for themselves a disciplinary uh, respectability. So new archaeology encouraged medieval archaeologists in some way, historical archaeologists, to reject the written sources, to reject the idea that the written sources could help them to reconstruct history. And what historical archaeologists did then was to assert that their, their practice, the practice of archaeology, allowed them to be equal to historians. They too could reconstruct all aspects of past societies. One study of the transition from the late Roman period to the Anglo-Saxon period in Britain, a, a book written by uh, Professor Chris Arnold, uh, just called From Roman Britain to Anglo-Saxon England. This book begins by saying, I will not use any written sources. I will not have any evidence from written sources in this book because the written sources are fundamentally biased. The written sources, the documentation, is likely to be distorted. Instead, Chris Arnold says, I will use the archaeological evidence. The archaeological evidence is not distorted. The archaeological evidence is not biased, but the written evidence is. So I will not use the written evidence. More generally, medieval archaeologists have been cautioned by many people to remember that documents almost always are created by elites and for elites. They're not created for us, they're not created for peasants, they're created by elites and for elites. And the assumption is these documents are biased and therefore they will not give us access 
to a direct, uh, to a, uh, an objective view of the historical past. Now, the converse or a corollary of the idea that texts are biased, that texts are partial, that texts are distorted, is the idea that archaeology deals with the unintended, the unconscious, the subconscious. This is an idea that's very common in his, uh, American historical archaeology, although you also find it in British historical, uh, British historical archaeology. Archaeologists of the later medieval period, like Sarah Tarlow, for example, at the University of Leicester, Sarah, they argue that one of the strengths of historical archaeology, one of the strengths of archaeology, is the fact that it recovers the, and I quote, the non-intentional material byproducts of past society. So the strength of archaeology is that it recovers that which is not intended to communicate information. So the texts are intended to communicate information, and therefore they are biased. Therefore, they're distorted. The strength of archaeology, it's claimed by these people, is that archaeology is recovering that which is not intended to communi communicate information. And because it's not intended to communicate information, it is not distorted, it is not biased. The assumption, therefore, is that archaeological objects, the things we recover archaeologically, the assumption is that these objects can tell us what the past was really like, that these objects allow us an objective view into the historical past. This is rather like what Carlo Ginzburg, going back to this book, uh, this is rather like what Carlo Ginzburg calls the psychoanalytical suggestion that it is in the tiny, seemingly insignificant, half-forgotten details that, that real secrets can be recovered. And again, in American, historical in American historical archaeology, the great Jim Dietz, he, he referred to this as the small things forgotten. Now, if you read a book on American historical, American historical archaeology, you should read the small things forgotten, because this summarizes really in many ways what American historical, historical archaeology is about, that it is in the small things, the tiny things that people accidentally lost, in these small things forgotten, this is where we find the reality of the past. And Ginsburg calls this a psychoanalytical uh, psycho thing, where tiny, insignificant, forgotten details, these contain the real secret. It's a little bit Freudian in some ways. So for many, historic, uh, for many historical archaeologists, these non-intentional objects are the material culture of everyday life. I spoke of the everyday yesterday. The everyday life here is the everyday of routine, of mundane daily living. And, and this seems to be what people mean by these non-intentional objects. Interestingly, they also see these non-intentional objects as largely the material culture of the peasantry, of the ordinary people, not the, the material culture of elites. And uh, the, the, this material culture is so commonplace that it is rarely talked about in written records. And so the assumption is it's in this kind of material culture that you find the reality of the historical past. Historical archaeologists, and this is another, another one of my main points, historical archaeologists, uh, especially of the later Middle Ages, but they claim that one of the great strengths of their discipline is their capacity, their ability to use objects, these small things forgotten, to write the history of the poor, to write the history of the dispossessed, to write the history of women, to write the history of children, to write the history of slaves, to write the history of the sick. They, they claim that only they can write these kind of histories because only archaeology gives you access to the material culture of these people. These people, they argue, are excluded from texts. These people, they are, because texts are written by elites, the argument is that non-elites are excluded from texts. So the poor, the dispossessed, the women, all of these people, it, it is argued, are uh, written, written out of texts. <laughs> Again, we get a summary of this in American historical, American historical archaeology from Jim Dietz. Jim Dietz puts this very well, very, very uh, aggressively. He says that 
texts provide us with the story. Texts provide us with the story of a small minority of deviant, wealthy, white males and little else. Archaeology, by contrast, provides access to the ways all people live their lives. So here you have a contrast between history, between texts, as the product of and telling us about only deviant, wealthy, white males. Whereas archaeology provides us with access to the historical past of everyone. Now this is put very, very strongly by Dietz. Uh, but it's, uh, the, the principle applies to many historical, historical archaeologists working both in Britain and in America. The idea that texts are so distorted, they're so much the product of elites, that we have to ignore them. And only archaeology can give you access to the historical past. But there's a very aggressive version of historical archaeology put forward both in Britain uh, and in America. Okay, can we move forward from those two very different positions? The two very different positions are one where our history is the master. History provides the framework within which archaeologists work. History provides all the questions that we have to answer. We only illustrate. And on the other hand, the idea that texts are so biased that we must ignore them. The texts tell us only about a certain section of society and that archaeology can tell us about all of society. Can we move away from those positions and move forward? The meaning of things. Can, can we, as archaeologists, extract meaning? Can we make things speak? Philip Grierson said the spade doesn't lie because it can't speak. Botero says we are, uh, material remains are speechless. Can we make material things speak to us about the past? The fact that archaeologists have spent uh, at least three generations, maybe four, maybe five generations of archaeologists, have tried, have had to try very hard to extract meaning from objects, should make it clear that the archaeological record is not unmediated, it is not unbiased, it is not an objective source. We have to struggle to get meaning from the archaeological record. It doesn't speak to us easily. So it's not an uh, objective, it's not an unbiased source. What's perhaps less obvious, and certainly less obvious to American and British archaeologists, is the fact that these small things forgotten, these small incidental objects of everyday life that we recover archaeologically, that these should not be considered as unintentional. These are not unintentional objects. Just because they're small, just because they're dropped and forgotten, doesn't mean that they were not produced to contain and to communicate meaning. People in the 12th century, for example, almost certainly never imagined that the plates they used, the spoons they used, uh, the, the bottles, the jugs they used, they certainly did not consider that these objects would become evidence for us. They were not produced as evidence for us. Uh, the great uh, Romano-British archaeologist and philosopher Collingwood, R.G. Collingwood was talking about some flints, and he said, remember, these flints were not produced as evidence. These flints were produced to be used at the time. So they're produced not for us, but for them. But then that's also true of historical sources. The written sources were not produced as evidence for us either. The historical sources were also produced for use at the time. They were produced as things to be used for particular purposes at the time. So the archives, for example, of Louis XIV, these archives were designed for the benefit of contemporary administrators. They were not designed for the benefit of future historians. So they were not produced as evidence. They were produced to be used at the time. In the same way, the earliest writing systems in Samaria the earliest writing systems in Egypt, the earliest writing systems in Crete and in Greece, these also were administrative in function. They had a use at the time. They were not produced as evidence for us. And this is also true of some late antique written sources from, from Spain that Chris Wickham talks about in his uh, Framing the Early Middle Ages. All of, these, all of these written sources were produced to be used at the time, not as evidence for uh, future archaeologists or, or future historians. 
And this is really the central point that I, I, I'm trying to communicate in this presentation, but also in the, the presentation that I wrote for uh, Juan Antonio in, uh, for his sp book in, in Spanish. It's not usually intended that objects or texts survive as evidence about the past. It was not, sorry, it wasn't usually intended that objects or texts survive as evidence about the past. But we shouldn't doubt that in the context in which they were produced, in the context in which they were used, these objects and the texts were meaningful. They had meaning. I tried to talk a bit about, about this yesterday. I'm talking much more theoretically about it now. But these objects had meaning. One example from anthropology. In this uh, fantastic book, uh, an anthropologist called uh, Janet Hoskins, uh, she's writing, the book is called Biographical Objects. And it's uh, the subtitle is How Things Tell the Stories of People's Lives. So what she's trying to do is, that it, is to say is that things, objects, contain memories. Objects contain and, and are the bearers of meaning. And this is a direct contradiction of people who argue that the spade cannot speak because objects bear these kind of meanings. They're deeply meaningful. Now, what she's, she's talking, in fact, about uh, a, a group of people in Indonesia, in eastern Indonesia, and she's talking about how ordinary, everyday objects, ordinary objects like, like this. In fact, she has a, a big chapter on glass bottles, how green glass bottles contain the stories of people's lives. So she's talking about a bag, glass bottles, about spindles, the kind of things that we recover archaeologically all the time. In this society, these objects, these small things, were deeply, deeply meaningful. They were intimately bound up with the memories, with the traditions, with the values of the people who used them. And she says that our inability, the inability of us in the 21st century in the Western world, our inability to see this is a product of the fact that we have a, a depersonalized relationship with objects. Our relationship with objects is very different, she says, from the relationship that people in the past had with objects. To quote, I, I'll read this. She says, we do, we do not usually know where an object was made. We do not usually know what materials went into the object. We don't know the exact processes involved in the manufacture of the object. We, she says, are alienated from even the voyeuristic pleasures of participating in production, and we're made to play the role of consumers whose only choice lies in the supermarket aisles. The decline in industrial employment in advanced capitalist societies means, she says, that an ever smaller proportion of the population has any direct experience of making things. So she says, we have no direct personal relationship with making objects. And therefore, we have a very de depersonalized relationship with objects. And that depersonalized relationship with objects, she argues, prevents us from seeing, from understanding that objects, even the smallest, apparently most mundane object, had meaning in the past. Now that, that kind of understanding, the kind of understanding produced by anthropologists like Janet Hoskins, and there are many others uh, working on a similar theme, this has allowed historical archaeologists or some historical archaeologists to move away from a position of seeing objects simply as the residue of past societies, away from seeing objects simply as evidence about past societies, moving towards a position in which objects have an active voice. They play an active role in the practice of past societies. And the critical point here is that here, in this kind of anthropology, and in the kind of historical, historical archaeology that's now emerging, objects from the past are not just evidence. Objects from the past are not evidence from or for that past. 
But objects are now considered as the media through which human beings constructed themselves and constructed their communities. They had an active role in the construction of past societies. They're not evidence for, well, they are evidence for those societies, but more than that, they had an active role in the construction of those societies. And this, very critically, applies as much to the mundane as to the monumental. This applies as much to ordinary, everyday objects as it applies to the cross that I talked about yesterday. One example from America, uh, again, where some very interesting work is being done on these kind of things, where uh, some, a paper by Mary Baudry and Anne Jensch, they're talking about thimbles. Uh, I don't know how to say thimbles in, in Italian, but it's the little things you put on your finger for, for sewing. And they had a big study of thimbles in 17th century America. Most, the most mundane, ordinary, everyday objects. Sometimes not so mundane, sometimes made of silver, sometimes quite heavily decorated like this one, but generally mundane, ordinary objects. The kind of thing that Jim Dietz called the small things forgotten, just to tossed away. What they did was to show from the, the context of the thimble, from the decoration of the thimble, from the, the initials, the names on the thimble, that in fact these thimbles were, were emblematic of the values embedded in an ideology of femininity. They allowed women to construct themselves as as women in this, these particular societies. And, and, and they also had a very direct relationship with class in, in these particular societies. So even ordinary, everyday objects had this kind of meaning. And if we as archeologists understand the context in which they were produced and the context in which they were used, we can extract that meaning uh, and, and write histories from it. So what then? of text. So what, what, what I'm arguing there, essentially, is that objects are more than evidence. Objects are, were used in the past to construct communities, to construct identities. And that if we use a contextual archaeology, uh, a version of post-processual archaeology, we can extract that meaning and we can write histories. Now, what about texts? I noted earlier in the presentation that uh, one of the strengths claimed for historical archaeology uh, in opposition to uh, historians who said that archaeology uh, was speechless, one of the strengths claimed for histor historical archaeology was that it could bring into history those who were uh, left out of, who were written out of the textual sources. So archaeologists claim that they can write the history of the poor, only they can write the history of the dispossessed, only they can write the history of women, because these, these, these sections of society are omitted from the texts. That claim, in fact, is, is massively, is vastly overstated. This, this really is not the case. But it is a claim made very, very vociferously in historical archaeology. Again, it's an archaeology trying to stake a claim for itself in opposition to history. But in fact, they overstate the case. It just is not true that these people are written out of the sources. And in fact, historians have spent a lot of time and considerable ingenuity actually recovering these, what Eric Wolf called in his book, recovering these people without history. So Wolf did this. Wolf was an historical anthropologist. He, he recovered these people without history. And there are many, many examples of historians actually recovering the voices of the people who were oppressed, who were left out of the text. So I'm just, I'm telling, I'm saying the claim of historical archaeology to be so, uh, to be the only discipline to write this history is simply wrong. One other example. What, what I argue, in fact, and what Wolf is arguing in, in this book, is that these people are, are not voiceless. These people are not written out of the sources. These people, in fact, are entangled in the texts. They're entangled and also oppressed by the text. Not something I want to come back to uh, in a second. But one example of, of how historians have actually extracted these, these marginal groups from the written sources. This is a, 
a painting of the, the witchcraft trial at Salem in, in, in Massachusetts. And these were some of the most marginalized females in American society. They were marginalized in, in, in class terms, they were marginalized economically, they were marginalized uh, socially, they were marginalized ideologically. But they were recovered, the, the, they were recovered from, the, from history by a deep study of the written sources. The written sources, even the most mundane written sources, the, the wills that people left, the archives that were kept, the, uh, the church rolls, the uh, inventories of estates, all of these uh, texts studied by historians allowed historians to recover what you might call the reality of this most, disp this most um, marginalized of social groups. So the claim of historical archaeologists to be able, only historical archaeologists, to be able to recover these people simply isn't true. And this, this, sorry, and this is, this is what, what I was trying to say is that, is that these textual records, these written records, used to recover the voices of these witches in early America, these, these uh, sources allowed historians to reconstruct the web of social relationships out of which the witchcraft trials emerged. It allowed historians to understand why these women were accused of witchcraft. It allowed the historians to understand the sociology uh, of witchcraft. And the same is true of 17th century America, of third, third millennium BC Samaria, but also of 8th century England. These villagers, the villagers of North America, were entangled in literacy. They were entangled in the texts. The texts were a very active force in their world. The texts were not just evidence about their world, the texts were used to entangle them. And in studying those texts, you can recover their voices. Now, the idea that texts were, are more than a record of past events is one that has great antiquity. So the idea that texts are, are more than just a record is one that goes back a long time. In fact, Isidore of Seville uh, talks about this a little bit in, in, in some er very early writings. But, but the, the most famous writing on the power of texts is that by uh, these two men. Uh, on, the, on this side is Walter Ong, uh, from, and on this side is Jack Goody. So this, the so-called literacy thesis put forward by Goody and Ong is, is one of the, the, the main sources for people who argue that texts, in fact, are extraordinarily powerful in past societies. Most of the work is done by, uh, most of the kind of theoretical work was, is done by Ong, and, and Goody does much more of the historical anthropological work on, on texts. They developed what has, what has become called the literacy thesis, the idea that writing fundamentally transforms society. Now, there are two, there are two parts to this thesis. One part I won't talk about at all, but we can discuss it later if you want. Uh, this part is a part which says that writing fundamentally transforms the way we think. There's an argument that writing transforms the human brain, a, a, an argument that writing transforms the way the brain works. So I, I, I won't go into that. It's a very, very difficult argument. It's an argument that's been discredited by many people, but is making a comeback in the work of some Canadian psychologists. So I'll leave that for a side for a moment, but if you want to discuss it, I'm, I'm happy to do, so, to do so later. The other side of the literacy thesis is, is it emerges from what Jack Goody called the, the preservative potentiality of writing, the fact that writing preserves speech. So I speak, and normally, normally this speech would just disappear. We have a recording, so this time it doesn't disappear, but normally it would just disappear. You write it down, it's preserved. So writing has a preservative potentiality, and Goody says the power of writing stems from the fact that writing preserves speech. He says that because writing preserves speech, this makes writing a technology. This allows writing to be a vehicle for the exercise of power. So because writing preserves speech, it is a technology, and therefore it can be used uh, to, to exercise power. Goody says that writing transforms, and you see here, the evanescent world of sound. This, this evanescent world of sound is transformed, he says, to the quasi 
permanent world of space. So it's a movement from, from mouth to space. It's a spatial record on a written sheet. He says that writing enables speech, what I'm saying, to be transmitted over space and preserved over time. This means that you can communicate with those not yet born. You can communicate with those who are removed geographically from you. You can communicate over thousands of miles, or you can communicate with the future. And, and Goody then says that because of writing, the range of human intercourse, the range of human interaction, is extended both in time and in space. And this has very major consequences for the organization of society, he argues, and many other, argue, many other people argue as well. Because of the power of writing that, that emerges from these facts, obligations, rights, thoughts, actions, all of these things can be recorded permanently. They can all be transmitted both to the ends of the earth and to those not yet born. The construction of these records, Goody argues, meant that you could have a, a greater depth of knowledge stored. It allowed greater depth of knowledge to be stored by societies. He argues, and one of the central points of the literacy thesis, is that writing provided elites both with the capacity to generate and the capacity to store more knowledge about their subjects and also provided elites with the capacity to exercise more control over their subjects. So writing wasn't just a record in past societies. The texts that you study were not just records of, of what happened. In fact, Goody argues, and the literacy thesis argues, that writing fundamentally was fundamental in the control of populations in the past. And this was true, this was true from the very beginning. From the very beginnings of writing in Samaria, it's argued that writing was a vehicle for oppression. Writing was a vehicle for suppression. Writing was a vehicle for elite power. So for example, Clarice Herrenschmidt, uh, in, a, in a book uh, written with uh, Jean Botero called Ancestor of the West, they're looking at the role of uh, Mesopotamia in, in Western ideology and in Western belief. But uh, Herrenschmidt uh, is talking about fourth millennium BC texts, es essentially these kind, of, these kind of objects. These are cylinder seals. And she says, as you can read below, she says, insofar, uh, and these are cylinder seals in cuneiform, so it's a kind of very, she says, insofar as a cylinder seal impression on a bulla, a stamp, was the signature of a functionary of the state indicating an administrative action and therefore, in event, a repression. So she sees writing from the very beginning as a repression. She says, therefore, it is possible to say that people began to write because written accounts maintained social order. So from the very beginning, she says there's a very direct relationship between writing and oppression. Writing is not just a record. Writing is not just an account of what happened. Here, writing is about social control and about uh, order. The great anthropologist, uh, Levi Strauss, Claude Levi Strauss, he said that the, the thing with which writing is most associated is not, is not civilization, but slavery. He said writing is the thing that's most associated with is slavery. Uh, many sociologists and anthropologists have developed the same theme, that, that writing is deeply and deeply intimately associated with the repression of people. So writing has power. It's not just a neutral vehicle. It's not just a neutral uh, way of communicating information about the past. Writing has power uh, to oppress. Some historical examples. Keith Hopkins, great, uh, sadly died uh, Roman uh, historian, uh, he, he talks about writing as an instrument of power, and I'll talk more about this later. He talks about writing as an instrument of power in the Roman world. Charles Briggs, who's a medieval historian, he, he talks about the sinister role of writing in the Middle Ages. He sees writing as a, a quote, he says, a means to power for elites. So writing is a means to power for elites. Writing, he says, is a corrosive, an acid, acting 
on communal bonds between people. It dissolves the communal bonds between people in the hands of elite. And in the more modern period, in the early modern period, Peter Burke, a sociologist, he says that the monopoly of information contained in archives of early modern states was a means to power. So the archive and the writing was a means to power uh, for, these, for these sociologists and for these anthropologists. So here, writing is not just a record, it's an instrument of oppression. It's an instrument of oppression in the hands uh, of elites. And that really is the message that I put forward in the book Archaeology and Texts. Archaeology and Texts. That, that writing is an, uh, a product of elites used by elites for oppression. I think, however, now that the focus on text only as oppressive is, is problematic. Because the focus on, elite, on, on text only as oppressive denies that people in the past understood what was happening to them. It denies the agency of, of, of people in the past. It denies the possibility that people could use their understanding of the written word to resist oppression. And this is something I want to talk about quite a lot uh, in, in the section that follows. The idea that people understood, peasants understood the power of writing, and, and they, they used that power themselves. So the, the, idea that, the, the idea I put forward that texts are only oppressive, I, I think now is too strong. And I'll, I'll try and demonstrate some of that later. There seems to be a, an emerging consensus from archaeologists, from philologists, from uh, sociologists, anthropologists, historians, People now seem to accept that texts and other objects were active in, in historical processes, that, that these objects were not just evidence, that they were used, actually used in driving forward uh, the historical process. Most people would now agree that the impact of texts depended on the society in which they were, they, pardon me, they were used. And in every instance, texts always interacted with other kinds of communication. Texts weren't uniquely powerful. There were always other kinds of information with which texts interacted. But all people, almost all people, would now confirm that texts were much more than just neutral evidence from the past. And what I propose is that, I, and this is also what I proposed in the book Archaeology and Text, is that a contextual approach a contextual approach, as for example, espoused by Ian Hodder and, and many other people in post-processual archaeology, that this textual approach, which is expansive enough to include the idea that people constructed themselves through objects and texts, this, to me, offers the possibility of transcending the boundaries, the disciplinary boundaries, between archaeology and history. Now, what I want to do next is to use three case studies to illustrate how we can draw upon the power of texts combined with the meaningfulness of objects to reconstruct what, what have been called now textual communities in the historical past. And the three, the three case studies are one from the Roman world, uh, one from the medieval world, the early medieval world in England, and then one from early modern America, just to show how texts were used in these particular societies to construct the communities of which they were a part, both as agents of oppression but also as instruments of enlightenment and instruments of liberation. Okay, we maybe stop for five or ten minutes and then continue.